The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. And hello and welcome. It's Charles Christian here on the Weird Tales radio show. And with me is my co-host, Janie, who's back this week. Hello, everyone. (laughs) Thank you. And for those of you who are counting, this is show number 75. And Janie, I think you've got a bit of reader response. Yes. Now, we don't like to boast because we're English. We don't do that sort of thing, but... (laughs) Did have an absolutely lovely comment in, which I thought, if you just indulge me, I'll read out. It's from Lisa Bumblebee, obviously. Probably not her real name. That's her Instagram moniker. And um, I was tickled pink, actually. Shall I read it to you? Yes, please yeah, okay. do. Just, she says, just wanted to say how much I love your podcast and listening to you talk. Oh, um, you have a lovely, easy to listen to voice, and both of you are very clear. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, you both sound like you're really enjoying making the shows, and you know that's true. We do, don't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we're trying to make it entertainment. Yes. What entertains us, mm-hmm. hope it entertains you, mm-hmm. and fun, but interesting as well, of course. Um, and she goes on and says, "I feel that you are smiling as you are presenting," which. I mostly am. Yes. I'm grinning Some- like an idiot most of the time, really. <laughs> Sometimes for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. And anyway, she said she finds them informative on an interest that she enjoys. And she always learns something new, as I do, which I think is half the point of it, really, that we're always looking for new stuff and mm, interesting mm, stuff mm-hmm. that we sense that um, you, our listener, would be interested in. Anyway, um, she says, oh, if you can sense your listenings, listeners at all, this one is smiling as I'm listening. Keep going. Can't wait for each episode. Ah. That's, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. We <laughs> Thank shall carry on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, well, we're kicking off the show today with a selection of uh, paranormal news in brief items. First off, from Vietnam. Authorities there have told Buddhist monks at a pagoda that they must stop their bad karma eviction ceremonies after an investigation by the police found the rituals were a total scam. It was the Ba Vang Pagoda in Quang Ninh province and apparently thousands of people have over the years been paying in some instances, substantial amounts of money to have their bad karma vanquished. Fees range from forty to fifty dollars, that's US, up to a massive twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Seriously bad karma there. Clearly, the Buddhists don't quite get the Buddhist comic concept of karma that uh, what you do in this world will come back to haunt you in the next one. Otherwise, they might not be quite so keen on it. Moving now over to the US and uh, early in July, the Federal Appeals Court uh, for the uh, US, uh, the 11th US Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, so it's a Florida court, ruled that Brevard County, Florida, um, violated the Constitution by limiting its invocation speakers to believers in certain faiths. They found that they favoured Christians and discriminated against deists and Wiccans who wanted to say a few words of prayer. The three-judge panel ruled that Brevard County had selected invocation speakers in a way that favours monotheistic religions and categorically excludes from consideration other religions uh, solely based on their belief system. Out of 195 invocations over a six-year period, only seven were given by non-Christians. Of those seven, 
Six were administered by Jewish rabbis, one by an officer from the city of Melbourne. So I'm guessing they don't understand that Australians in Melbourne are Christians as well, or a lot of them are. Anyway, a member of Americans United for Separation of Church and State said... Religious minorities and non-believers are equal members of society and they must be treated equally by their elected officials. The court's decision today made clear that no one should be excluded from civic affairs because of their beliefs about God. A number of legislative bodies, including both chambers of Congress, that's the Congress in Washington, regularly open business with a prayer. The Federal Appeals Court in for Washington, D.C. ruled in April this year that the U.S. House of Representatives can exclude secular messages. But as uh, Robert Tuttle, a law professor with the George Washington University, said, while Monday's ruling won't affect Capitol Hill, there could be some conflict that the higher court may need to settle. There appears to be a difference between excluding secular messages and those religious messages from non-traditional religions. So, there you go. You win some and you lose some. But if you're a Wiccan in Florida, you now can, should you want to, give an invocation message. New guide to electric fairyland, it says here on a piece of paper. Yes, Neil Rushton. We've interviewed him in the past for the Weird Tales radio show. He regularly blogs on All Matters Fay and, coincidentally, the Pink Floyd on his Dead But Dreaming website. And uh, last week he produced this an excellent guide to online resources that discuss fairies, the Fay, in all their various guises. And uh, I spent a couple of hours following all the links. And if you're interested in Matters Fay, uh, you probably will as well. And we're also pleased to report that the Weird Tales radio show got a glowing mention on his list of sites. Uh, you can find Neil on HTTPS colon double slash dead but dreaming. That's dead but dreaming. All one word. Dot wordpress.com. And jolly good it is too. Hexfest. One we've never heard of, but it's been running on for a number of years. And August 9th to 11th at the Bourbon Orleans Hotel in New Orleans, they are holding a weekend of witchery. And it's got large vendor section. Uh, there is very comprehensive course of events from uh, 9 a.m., on a Saturday morning through till six o'clock. And then there's evening events as well. And on the first day, there is also a riverboat uh, trip ritual. A lot of good presenters there. If you're into all matters wicker and uh, witchcrafty and voodoo, uh, Brian Kane, Christian Day... Lady Rhea, Star Ravenhawk. Anyway, which doctor you two? Uh, good, good, good program. Uh, you can find it at uh, www.hexfest.com. Go to the website. All the details are there. The registration fee for the whole weekend is $370. That does not include accommodation. You'll still need to book somewhere to stay. But the hotel is uh, right in the centre of uh, the French Quarter, next to the St. Louis Cathedral and Jackson Square. And it's reputedly one of the most haunted buildings in New Orleans. Um, was a convent at one stage variety of ghosts said to haunt it so there you go and the other point to make is it is quite a small convention so they've only got 300 places so first come first served if you're in the lobby and you see an elderly man sitting there in the late afternoon smoking a cigar and reading a newspaper 
Don't tell him to put his cigar out because it's a no smoking hotel anymore, because he's a ghost and he will typically stand up, harumph and march away. Anyway, that's Hexfest taking place at the 9th to 11th of August at the Bourbon Oleans Hotel. For our latest interview, we're talking to Morgan Sylvia. Uh, she is a she's a writer and poet, and she describes herself as a metalhead, an Aquarius, a beer snob, a coffee addict, and a work in progress. She's also a former obituarist and now full time writer. Her first novel, called Abode, came out in 2017, and she's just recently released the first volume of a fantasy thriller trilogy called Dawn. We're particularly interested in uh, Morgan's uh, views because uh, she is based in New England, so that is Stephen King and H.P. Lovecraft territory. Right, and it's my great pleasure to be talking to Morgan Sylvia. And uh, I suppose the first question is, how did you get into writing your horror, dark fantasy type books and poetry? Um, I'm also looking at some of your credits, which include Forgotten Realms, Wicked Witches, Northern Frights. What got you into that? I think it was just where, um, what fit me the best. Um, I actually started writing very, very young. Um, I was born and raised in Maine and I was an only child and my mother was a librarian. Um, we were in a kind of remote area. Um, and, uh, whenever I would say some, you know, I was bored or anything like that, my mom's response was always to give me books to read. So I was, you know, I basically gobbled up books and I mm -hmm. just started, writing for fun. And then as I grew older, my taste just kind of grew darker and it just sort of, that's just sort of where the muse led me, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you think, cause I see you're a part of the new England horror writers and you live in Maine. Do you think that part of the world has an influence on your writing? You know, we, we tend to think of it as, um, you know, I know it's not quite that area, but the pill, you know, the Pilgrim Fathers and H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and Salem Witch Trials and things like that. It always seems to be one of the darker areas of America. Um, I would say yes and no. I mean, I think one thing that definitely lends itself to this type of uh, literature and art is just the fact that um, in winters we have you know, very short days and there's a lot of long, cold nights and that just goes very well with reading. Um, and the landscape and just, you know, a lot of the buildings here are older than what you see in a lot of you know parts of the country or in some parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, so there's kind of a feeling of, you know, history and dark, cold forests and things like that. It's um, living in Maine, of course, you know, we're all kind of under the shadow of Stephen King and it's not necessarily hard to see where some of his stories uh, came from. Like, for instance, uh, The Mist, um, just a couple of nights ago, I was driving home and it was really, really foggy out. You couldn't see, and, you know, so it's, you know, so the landscape does kind of lend itself <clears throat> to, I think, darker fiction. And also, I think um, a secondary thing about that is when you've got these long, cold winters, um, it just it really fosters a love for reading. I mean, there's no better way to sit through a snowstorm to me than to just curl up with a good book and, you know, a cat and a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, th I think there's a lot of appreciation for it around here. Yes. Because yes. of that. Are the, the forests, are they still a thing there? I mean, it's not my part of the world, so I don't, I've never visited there. Are you, you know, in close proximity to the woods and things like that? Yeah, I'm in a fairly remote area. Um, Maine's just very woodsy kind of overall. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we like to drive around also and just explore these little nooks and crannies. And I'm actually not very far from uh, where uh, Thoreau went. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just a beautiful, you know, kind of a beautiful area. And what's the sort of general theme of your work for people aren't familiar with your books? 
Um, they're all different. Um, Abode is kind of a, a haunted house story with uh, a twist. Um, winter itself figures very, you know, very heavily into it. Um, that was drawn on a couple of things that I experienced and just things that scared me. Um, I just kind of wanted to explore some of, you know, one of the more classic tropes of horror, that being a haunted house, but I wanted to do it kind of my way. Um, Dawn was very different. Dawn is um, a fantasy novel. Um, That's much more intricate. Um, I would kind of, I guess, nutshell description of Dawn, you could describe it as uh, the Tudors meets Spartans meets Druids, and it's set on this post-technological world. There's a lot of intrigue and warfare, and um, so there's that. And I, I found I had a lot of fun playing with those those elements. And then um, mm-hmm. you know my short stories, they're just they're all kind of different. You know, it's just kind of whatever whatever I want to explore um, in each one. It just kind of comes to me that way. Yeah, yeah. You were at the Daughters of Darkness Market. That sounds fascinating. What was that about? <laughs> Oh, that was amazing. Uh, that was in Salem a uh, couple, I guess a couple months ago now, maybe a month or so. Um, Amber Newberry Izzo, she owns a store in Salem and uh, she had put together this amazing night market. And it was just kind of a, like almost like a little festival with different vendors of doing different things. Um, being that it was set in Salem, of course, there are a lot of um, kind of witchy, darker uh, arts artisans there. And uh, it was held at the Hawthorne Hotel, which is one of the uh, old historic hotels. Mm-hmm. And um, it was absolutely packed. There was a line around the door. I don't think everybody got in until maybe 10 o'clock or something like that. It went really, really well. And it was just, that was a great night. So I was very grateful to be able to participate in that. Oh, that was actually the uh, official lunch for uh, As the Seas Turn Red. That was... Uh, the day that that finally officially saw daylight. <laughs> As the seas turn red is your collection of uh, poetry. Correct. That's uh, ocean-themed poetry, so it, it delves into all these different uh, topics, everything from mermaids to ghost ships to whales to environmental issues. Um, it's kind of all over the place as far as, you know, things that I could – things that, you know, are just related to the ocean and the seas. Um yeah. Yeah, that's actually my second collection. Uh, the first one is currently out of print. That was an apocalyptic horror poetry collection called yeah. Whispers from the Apocalypse. Yeah, it's gr- you've got a great cover for As the Seas Turn Red as well. Absolutely. Uh, that was done by uh, Joseph Schmalky, who's another Mainer. And um, I was looking around for cover artists and I just, you know, was really impressed with his work, and I have to say that he absolutely knocked it out of the park. I love it. It's it re- it really pops even from across the room. Like you can see it. Mm, um, mm, mm. I'll be walking through the room, and like there'll be a copy laying out, and it, it still kind of grabs my eye. So I'm absolutely delighted with his work. Yeah. How, how's that going in terms of sales? Um, it's weird. When I when I was at the night market, I I think I sold out or almost sold out of it. Um. Online, it's been a little bit slow. Um, marketing is probably not my strong suit, so I probably should be doing more than more than I have been. Um, I did just do a reading the other day in New Hampshire at a little bookstore called A Free Thinker's Corner, and uh, it went over well. So, um, as far as sales go, it's kind of a more of a, a marathon, I think, than a sprint. So, hopefully, I'll just be able to keep you know keep building on it and keep getting the word out about it. Your debut novel, Abode, again, that from the cover work looks like witches and evil spirits in the woods. What's that about? Just not obviously not giving away any of the plot, but what's what's the theme behind that one? Um, I guess in a in nutshell, it is it's a haunted house story. It's told a little bit differently. Um, I think I'll just. I won't go into spoilers, but um, I'll just kind of go through some of the things that have been revealed through reviews. Um, A lot of it is done in second person. It's in the forms of emails to this man who thinks he has met his reincarnated little sister. Mm -hmm. And this is basically like 20 years after the events of the house, which it ended up burning down at the end. And uh, he lost his sister. So as he's basically emailing this woman, he's going into what happened. And at the same time, things start happening again. Um, 
there are witches. There are uh, a lot of paranormal spirits, like demons and things like that. It's a very dark book. Um, one thing people often mention is that it has like a very poetic feel. I guess like I don't know if it has to do with me being a poet or not, like or just my love of language. Um, I hear that a lot, that it's kind of got a very poetic type feel for a novel. So, and I've been told that it scares people a lot. So (laughs) happy about that. Uh, Is that a key thing that you like to scare people when you, when they read your books? Well, I think if you're writing horror, I mean, there's, you know, horror goes in so many different directions. These, these, you know, there's many different topics and and kind of canons that you can go into, but I kind of wanted to go for something sort of classic. And, um, my thing was, you know, I need to scare myself or I won't scare anyone else. And I actually did scare myself quite a bit while I was writing it. Um, it did end up making the Sorry, sorry, I was going to yeah, say, that's that's an interesting take on it, yes, that you, you, you're you actually scaring yourself when you do it, yes. Yeah, it's funny. There's this one scene where uh, there's they're hearing scratching, you know, weird scratching and scraping noises and things like that, and, you know, all sorts of, when they're, you know, when, when they're uh, in the house, and uh, at the same time, we happen to have mice or something, because yeah. I would be writing, and then I would hear something scratching, and I was just like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> It kind of worked. It did make the uh, recommended reading list for the Stokers that year, but it did not get actually nominated. So, yeah, but. right, yeah. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. And uh, what are you? Uh, I mean, I see your uh, sort of full time, if you like, the day job is as a journalist. Is that correct? Uh, not exactly. I'm more of a blogger. I do some music journalism on the side. Um, but for my day job, I'm a freelance blogger. Right, right. So I write pretty much every day. Every day. Right. What's your next project or, you know, the next thing you're working on? Or you're probably already working on something. Well, I've got, I guess, uh, I've got a couple of things that have been sold but have not come out yet. Um, one being I placed a story in, uh, another New England horror and anth- horror writers anthology, which is called Wicked Haunted. I'm sorry. Wicked Weird is this, is, uh, is that that's coming out in August. Um, I've got a short story coming out in that. Um, I've also got a short story coming out in another New England anthology, which is, uh, new based on New England folklore. And that one is called the anthology is called Wood But Time Await. Um, I recently sold a story to Pseudopod, and that should be out, I'm not sure when, um, but I've got that in the pipeline as well. Um, Those are all things that I've finished and that are, you know, kind of sold and just sort of waiting to come out. As far as what I'm working on, probably the next thing out the gate will be book two of Dawn. Um, It's done. I just need to do um, some editing and tightening and polishing and things like that. and that will be coming out through Crossroads Press, um, as the first book did. Um, I'm also working on something. I'm not. Sh- I'm assuming it's probably going to be a novel. I'm not totally sure it's not a novella, uh, but there are two sort of connected ones, and I'm not sure whether I'm going to make them into one novel or two connected novels. Or um, so that is kind of still uh, in the process of uh, just working on the first draft of that. Hmm. And that's more of a horror project as well. And with your longer work, books, novels, as opposed to short stories, what is your approach to writing them? I mean, I I meet some people who carefully draft out the entire novel um, from the beginning and others who... Really, I suppose, what's the phrase? Pantsers, you know, fly by the seat of the pants, and often themselves don't know how the book is going to develop. Where do where where do you fit into that approach to writing? It's funny because I actually just piece, just posted a meme about that, um, and there were just different choices like lawful plotter and chaotic pantser. Um, I am more of a pantser, definitely. Um, I do have one project that I tried to plot out, and it's like taking forever. I kind of just go back to it sometimes, but for the most part, I just start out with, uh, I kind of brainstorm something, I guess, or just get an idea and just start going with it and then build on it. And then at some point I sort of stop and try and figure out where I'm going with it. Um, but it's, 
not a method I would recommend. I usually end up painting myself into corners and uh, <laughs> kind of battling through it. But um, it's been a little bit different with each one. I will also say that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not really much for plotting beforehand because then it's just kind of, it just seems like more work. Like I already know what the story is. Now I just got to do the work. I like kind of just going where the story takes me a little bit more, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm more of a pantser. Definitely. What about your characters? As again, I know some people work out their characters in great detail and, you know, almost write a detailed life history CV biography of them, um, before they start using them so that the character's consistent. Do you do that? Or again, are you one of those, Certainly, I found myself in that position where you suddenly think, oh, my character's completely changed halfway through this book. I'm going to have to go back to the beginning and re-edit him or her. Yeah, um, that one's kind of hard to even explain. It's almost more like they, I, I'm meeting them or letting, or I'm discovering them, I guess. Um, uh, there's definitely a lot of like false starts sometimes with characters. Like it's funny, this, uh, the new project that I had, I decided to, um, use a friend of mine's name. And then it turned out that like, I know several people with the same name and, uh, I ended up, the character ended up like, as far as what I'm picturing them physically and how they act ended up being kind of more drawn on someone else entirely, but with a diff totally different personality. I kind of think what happens is like you meet all these people and it's like, my brain is like a blender, you know, you sort of <laughs> mix all these different traits out and then it just spits out this kind of conglomeration of different people and, and things like that. So um, there are very few times where someone is like very blatantly modeled over somebody but definitely like little traits and things of people that I know and also historical figures and, and things like that kind of come into play as far as uh, that part. That's brilliant. Well, thank you. Morgan, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you and uh, good luck with uh, all the new books. So uh, once again, many thanks for your time. Thank you so much for having me on. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. Something wicked this way comes. Weird Harvest Press presents Harvest Hymns, the sweet fruits and twisted roots of folk horror. A two-volume set of books investigating the music of folk horror featuring contributions from some of the biggest names in the field. Candia McCormack, Johnny Trunk, Maddie Pryor, Sharon Krause, Jim Jupp and Kemper Norton, to name just a few. Available now via lulu.com. 100% of all weird Harvest Press profits are donated to wildlife charities. Welcome to come of your own free will in the appointed place. It is time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. If you want to grow your business, save time using the latest tech, and look great online, Weird Appeal Digital can help. We have a free, yes, that's free, download listing 40 digital tools apps and resources to help you grow your brand, promote your project, generate leads and reach your audience. Just go to www.appeal.digital slash weirdtales for smart, effective digital design and your free download, go to www.appeal.digital slash weirdtales. We've had a lot of fun over the last couple of weeks, Janie and I, looking at Claude Lacuto's Dictionary of Ancient Magic Words and Spells, mainly from the Middle Ages to the early modern period, and frankly, some of them are a little on the barking side, uh, including one we're going to uh, have in the next section, which is a spell to make everybody get up and dance but not in a good way. 
Here's another medical one for you. Uh, this is to deal with um, a nosebleed. And you write the spell Burrow, Barto, Barta, Salama on a piece of paper. And then you stick it up mm. your nose. Mm. They had one bit right there, didn't they? Well, exactly. Well, they may have had both bits right, but, you know, certainly the paper up the nose is going to help, isn't it? Yes. Yes, you do, you, do, you do think that that's one sort of a problem with the causation. Mm. Anyway, okay. yeah. yeah. They did their best. They did. And here's another one um, for winning at cards. And to win at cards, one must first write these letters on your right hand. The letters are B-R-O-D-L-Y. In your own blood. <laughs> I can't help think that if you turn up at a card party with those letters dripping in blood on your hand, um, possibly people will... Let you win. Let you win. <laughs> Basically, we're scared. Scared. <laughs> we're scared of you, yeah. Ah, uh, dear. And there's millions more. There's millions more. We'll just have one little final one in this session here. And this is a little, a, a strange one. Uh, it appears to be quite a thing in Scandinavia in the uh, 17th and 18th century. And it's a spell to set everyone in a house a dancing. <laughs> and Why? There's, there's Why? several versions of it, but uh, this one is you say the words, you actually write them on an aspen leaf. Mm -hmm. okay. And then you place it beneath the threshold of the house and you write on it Elon, Agron, Grammaton. Hmm. And I say it crops up so many times there is a suspicion that perhaps dancing doesn't actually mean dancing a song, but dancing to your tune. Oh, dancing that makes more to sense. Your commands. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise you could just put on, well, anything by the Rolling Stones. Everybody get up. Well, exactly. Dance, really. Yes. <laughs> well, they would do if you'd invented a record player. <laughs> yes. Thank you, JD. See you later. Bye now. OK, so there's been a bit of a flurry of comments to your blog post. Um, the article, Ethel at the Gate. Mm -hmm. Remember that one? Yes, indeed. And um, it's on the website. Yes. The and, um, Which is www.urbanfantasist.com. Ah, thank you for that. Yeah, um, I was going to say that. Anyway, forgot. Uh, the the story is about a life size statue of, of of a woman, which is you know quite impressive, in a huge portico, and it's at Lawnswood Cemetery in Leeds. Mm -hmm. um, the latest comment is interestingly from the gardener at the cemetery, and and it is in response to the article and saying. We've just cleared the vegetation around the monument, um, but unfortunately the water staining, which you mention in the article, can't be touched for fear of eroding the marble. Um, anyway, indeed, the statue, he says, does seem to emanate some kind of presence, but not a forbidding presence. Uh, there's been a few other previous comments as well, basically all verification of your facts. Uh, one by a relative of a contemporary of the people that were involved, and he remembers being told the story. Uh, the me me memorial is actually well known by locals and um, sort of features in the local folklore and sayings. I just wondered, can you say and explain a little bit about the background? Because it's quite intriguing, quite mm. a good story. Mm. It was uh, now, oh, long time ago early 1970s when I was at Leeds University and we used to do a little bit of ghost hunting or paranormal investigation as it's now called and uh, we were intrigued by the stories uh, surrounding Lawnswood Cemetery where there is indeed this a very large um, memorial and um, as you said it's the portico, um, life-size portico to a house with a woman standing on the doorstep and the door behind, double doors, one is partly open. Is and there a, a 
photo at all on the website. There is indeed oh, that, a photo that, that, on the website. Kind of, because yeah. you're describing it, it'd be interesting. Yes. Uh, to go and have a look at that. Yes. Anyway, right, the facts are that it's about Ethel Preston and the memorial is to her. And she was the wife of a wealthy Leeds uh, manufacturing chemist called Walter Preston. And when she died in 1911, at the relatively young age of 50, the grieving widower commissioned one of his nephews, a skilled sculptor, to build the memorial we now see. It was constructed in white Italian marble and shows a life-size Ethel standing at a replica of the family home. The project cost in those days £2,000, which, according to my calculations, is £130,000 today. So that's pushing 150 to 200000 US dollars. And when formally unveiled in March 1913, it created such a stir that thousands of people took tram and charabank trips to Lawnswood and paid a penny of t- a time to queue up to see it. Good Lord. Well, they didn't have television in those days. But they think. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> or, or podcasts. Um, and I say, it's, it's uh, a good example of the era's sentimentality about death with the door behind Ethel slightly open to symbolise the way through to the afterlife and the fact that she was there waiting supposedly for her husband to return. That was the original explanation that she'd stand on the doorstep and uh, wait for him to return home after a long day in the office. And say that is the official version. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is, of course, Mm -hmm. another version to the story, which was that Walter was a notorious womanizer and frequently vanished for days on end. And uh, not surprisingly, when he did return home, uh, a rather harassed wife was waiting for (laughs) him. And it is suggested that his treatment led to her, his treatment of her led to her early death and the statue was carved to reflect his remorse. But we will just add the fact that um, it didn't take very long for him to remarry after her death. And uh, in more recent years, I say the thing has become stained by rainwater, uh, blackened. Uh, In more recent years, someone, or some people, maybe multiple ones, have taken to leaving fresh flowers at the memorial tucked into the arms of Ethel's statue. Ah. Yeah. And uh, there is a f- one of the say- sayings, because uh, she has uh, a, a rather sad, mournful expression, and uh, one of the phrases, sayings is, uh, you look so glum, you have a face like Lawnswood Ethel. Well, yes, because as I say, there was there were many other comments about um, yeah. sayings now yeah. used in the era, saying, "Oh, well, if if somebody stands on the edge of their doorstep when visiting, are you coming in, or are you standing there like Longswood <laughs> yes. Ethel?" So, yes. yeah, quite a big thing. Mm. So um, that's Ethel at Longswood, and the uh, cemetery is open to the public. Um, it's just outside the boundaries of Leeds and uh, if you're in the area well worth looking and um, I say seeing if is... there's that that slight what does somebody say slight aura slight feeling yes the gardener that's there there's there's something a feeling that you get when you stand near it so yeah um, that's interesting mm. a presence that's it a presence mm. yes but uh, yes uh, a slightly added to by the I suppose, the hypocrisy of the memorial. Yes. We won't say any further than that. We don't really know. So it would be perhaps not right to comment, but yes. Big guilt trip there, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Following an earlier story we ran here on the Weird Tales radio show about Charles Sampson's notorious book, Ghosts of the Broads, that's the Norfolk Broads, and the fact that 
they're great tales, but actually he made them all up. We have had a couple of requests in saying, can we recommend any other books on Norfolk, East Anglian, Suffolk and East Anglian, ghosts and folklore? Uh, there's a few here might be interested in. Uh, Suffolk Ghosts and Legends by Pamela Brooks, published by Holsgrove Publishing. As also Paranormal Suffolk, brackets True Ghost Stories by Christopher Reeve, published by Amberley Publishing. Uh, Paranormal Norfolk by Frank Mears, also by Amberley Publishing. Then going slightly more academic, we have Suffolk Fairy Law by Francis Young, and that's published was last year by the Lassie Press, that's L-A-S-S-E Press dot com, and um, you can buy all of those on Amazon. Finally, uh, for those more interested in magic and witchcraft, Anything by Nigel Pennick, but uh, one I particularly like is Secrets of East Anglian Magic. And it's published by the Capel Ban Publishing Company, C A P A L L Ban. And that includes one of our favourite topics here horse whisperers and toad men. Uh, these are all people who had skills, magical skills over livestock. Anyway, fascinating book and indeed all of them well worth reading and uh, you'll enjoy them. We've talked in previous episodes about the evil eye and uh, how it's put upon people and how you escape from it. Here's another version. Uh, it's from a book from... Uh, the 1920s, published in 1928. It's called Magic, Witchcraft, Charms, Cures and Customs in East Anglia. And it's by a Mark Taylor. And it tells of a woman who had the evil eye put on her by a farmer. He didn't like her. Took again her. So she cured herself by writing out the Lord's Prayer on a piece of clean paper. Then soaking the ink of the paper, so basically soaking the paper in water, so the ink floated off it and formed a diluted solution. And then she drank the water and that cured her of the evil eye. Handy tip to know. So, Charles, let me ask you something, because... Whenever you're interviewing people, you always ask them, often ask them, what sparked their interest in the paranormal and, and all things unexplained or mm -hmm. weird stuff. So can I ask you what got you first interested by the subject all those many, many, many years ago? Yes. Was there a, something, something happened? Well, there was, was one incident. I mean, I've never seen a ghost in the traditional sense of mm -hmm. ghostly shape or sheet with black eyes on it waffling towards me. However, I grew up in a very old house by the sea in Scarborough. It has lots of strange nooks and crannies and what had been warehouses and sail lofts and um, the upstairs attics were once apparently used by shipwrecked mariners and they would stay there wow. and uh what, what sort of era was that then what, what? this would have been in the uh not my childhood but uh, this would have been 19th century yeah, type yeah, of yeah. era okay. and uh certainly a psychic friend of my mother's claimed that she could hear the clump 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 of ghostly mariners in their sea boots walking along the uh floors of the mm -hmm. attic mm -hmm. which was obviously cheery because that was basically the floorboards above my bedroom <laughs> ceiling <laughs> anyway my one um well, more than once uh experience was 
when I was asleep in bed and I had the distinct sensation of somebody grabbing the footer of the bed, the sort of bottom bedboard, and jerking it backwards and forwards a couple of times. So the bed mm -hmm. shook sufficiently mm. to wake me. Goodness. Yes. And this, Pretty scared, I should imagine. Well, I was, because I was yeah. a tiny little child. And yeah, yeah. Thought, mm. and, and um, uh, I think I may have asked if someone was there, and I may have well thought it was maybe my parents popping in to see mm. me because I was at that. Wake up to see if you were still alive. Wake yeah, you, wake, wake, up up. To, wake up to see <laughs> if I was asleep, yes. Yes. <laughs> As they, they do. Um, but, you know, I was of, of that age when parents would still pop in to count you if you like and this happened many many occasions and could never see anything and never find out what it was and um, I did ask my father about this at some point and he said well he thought it was the wind hitting the side of the house because the house actually projected from the main street line and he said that as the wind blew along there, it hit the house and being old, it shook it, which made sense to me. Oh, I, I think he came up with that on the spur of the moment. I think he did. I think he did. <laughs> I think it would have been shaken to the ground if it was such a... Anyway, yeah. <laughs> You've been there, you know. What? <laughs> make, make anything up for yes. the kids, yeah. yeah. And uh, so when it would happen in future, I'd say, oh, just the wind and turn over and go to sleep. Uh, I was Only years later, it struck me, it couldn't have been correct because the bit of the house that my bedroom was in was not exposed. Mm -hmm. It was adjacent to another property. It was, yeah. Yeah. So obviously, I've been there. I've not been there. because I knew his childhood bedroom when exactly. he was a child. Exactly. Because, yes. Because, yes, because I have, obviously, it was the family house. The family house. And the other thing was uh, my bedroom was, if you like, on a uh, north. My bed was on a north south um, alignment. And the house was on an east west alignment. And if it had been the wind hitting the side of the house, it would have surely shaken my bed from side to mm. side mm. rather than up and down. Yeah, yeah. So what do you attribute it to? And did you try to find out in any way uh, what might have caused it? You know, lay a trap, stay up all night. Well, you're only a little kid. So I was only a little kid. Yeah. I, I, had, had I been older, I would have probably, um, I don't know, dusted the bottom of the bed mm -hmm. for fingerprints and then no doubt being terrified if there were <laughs> skeletal yes. little finger marks showing there. But uh, no, I didn't. So it remains a mystery mm. as to what it was. Yeah. Well, I think you must have felt some sort of presence as well because I, don't, I can't, you know, it probably would have just never occurred to you as anything, if you like, paranormal, that age, you just... Mm. Would have, you know, as a child, you just kind of blunder on, don't you? But exactly, yes. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so particularly that... the history, given the history of the house, Well, of well exactly, yes. And the clump, clump, clumping. Clump, clump, clumping. Which could have made the bed shake. Well, it could have been that. It mm. could have been that. And I say, there were lots of little passages underneath that people said were old smugglers' passages. Yes, yeah, there were. Or, or yeah. at least where they stored their loot. Mm. And mm. Uh, that is my... Ah, Ghostly encounter. I always wondered. Yes. Thank Set you. Set me, traumatised me from an <laughs> early age. <laughs> and here I am now. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Janie. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Here's a tale of witchcraft from Norfolk in the mid-18th century. So we're only looking 250 years ago. And... Uh, it goes like this. There was a farmer who believed a witch had put a curse on his horses so that the horses would never walk home properly. They'd just stand there and they wouldn't move forward or backward. And a local cunning man, that's the male equivalent of a witch, but 
they were generally regarded as being the good guys. They would help remove curses. He said, what you should do is bleed the horse from a certain vein on its leg, collect the blood in a pan, take the blood home after nightfall, uh, pour it into a frying pan and cook it on a fire until it started bubbling. That's the blood. And then you would take a sharp instrument, such as a fork, and you would prick the bubbles of blood and burst them. And whoever had bewitched the horse would be inflicted with pain as you prick them. And, lo and behold, so it transpired... The farmer did this, the horse was relieved, uh, started to work fine. After he'd done the ritual with the pricking the bubbles of blood. And a few days later, an old woman died in the village. She was believed to be a witch. And on her body were found small black marks in the middle of rings of dried skin. As if blistered had arisen and been pricked and dried upon her. Ta-da! There's a nice little cheery thought. And once again, the fickle finger of time has run out. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with your hosts, me, Charles Christian, and Janie Christian. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll be back the same time next week till we go well i always like to send you on your way with a cheery little missive to make you shiver in the dark of the night and here's one it's from uh, coleridge's rhyme of the ancient mariner just a thing to remember if you're walking home on a late night perhaps like i used to do take a quick shortcut through a graveyard like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned back, walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Told you it was a cheery one. Anyway, until next time, stay well, stay weird. Good night. Black Shuck The demon dog of East Anglia is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. Your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Urban Fantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.